we can move on to the next talk, which is going to be given by John Rogers. John Rogers is a, a very well-known person from the British Astronomical Association in the UK. Um, he's going to talk about, about the collaboration between amateur astronomers and, and the Juno mission. And his talk is titled, How Amateur Imaging of Jupiter with the Europlanet Telescope Network Could Benefit Science. Okay, well, thank you very much, Ricardo, for the invitation. Uh, I'll just get this up on the screen. Um, it's coming on. Now it's there, yeah. Okay. Perfect. And I say. Okay, so um, you've seen at least part of this picture before from Ricardo. Um, this is a superb picture from the Peak Geomedia taken in 2017 from uh, that workshop that Europlanet had, which really is, is an excellent model for how um, similar things might be done for imaging planets during the uh, period of the Europlanet Telescope Network operation. Um, <clears throat> now, the, the talk is going to be about what kind of collaborative observations could extend the limits of amateur imaging. Um, I'll start with a, a few other uh, a, a variety of, of possible approaches um, for focusing really on the uh, advantages of using high resolution observations from these professional observatories. Um, first of all, rapid response. Um, well, Lee has already mentioned this in connection with James Webb. Um, with regard to the European um, uh, Telescope Network, um, the key thing I think for rapid response would be that it might be possible to get a rapid uh, target of opportunity. And um, that, of course, would depend on the availability of particular observatories um, at notice of just uh, a couple of weeks time. So that's something that might be worth further discussion. Another area people might be interested in is use of alternative wave bands. Um, we amateurs think mostly in the uh, visible and the very near infrared. Um, but of course, there are tremendous opportunities for scientific imaging um, in slightly further into the infrared in the one to five micron region. Um, Ricardo knows about that very well with his work using Planet Cam. And um, amateurs could well be interested in getting involved in that. However, um, I think at the moment, the scientific impetus for such observations comes from professionals. And of course, it's the professionals who have the suitable filters and detectors for operating in these infrared wavelengths beyond one micron. So that would be a matter for, for discussion with um, professional uh, astronomers to see whether they are interested in having any amateur involvement for any reason. No. But the, the area that is um, the most obvious that uh, could be advantageous with the European Telescope Network is high resolution um, for two reasons. First of all, the location of the observatories. Now, um, when I prepared this talk, I understood that all the observatories were in Europe. Um, it seems there are some elsewhere, but um, we're not sure if those can do high resolution planetary imaging. Um, but even within Europe, um, those of us in Northern Europe are very conscious uh, that being in Southern Europe can be a big advantage and being up on a high mountain can be a big advantage because better seeing, better weather, um, better likelihood of uh, clear skies. Um, is going to be extremely important if one is going to be planning collaborative observations at an observatory uh, a little while in advance. And then, of course, aperture is important as well. Uh, many amateurs nowadays use a, a C14, which is 355 millimeters aperture. Um, but those who do have larger telescopes or access to larger telescopes can get higher resolution when the seeing is excellent. Uh, you see that in this pair of images uh, by two of the, the world's best amateur imagers. Um, on the left, Chris Goh, who is using a C14, and on the right, Damien Peach, who is using the remote one meter telescope uh, operated by Chiliscope. Um, and these are both in excellent seeing and taken about a week apart. But you can see that Damien's is actually somewhat sharper. Um, so uh, when you've got really good seeing, size still does matter. So for the rest of this talk, I'm going to be considering uh, certain examples of how, um, uh, how imaging could benefit science uh, if it's subject to being planned a few weeks or months ahead. And these are all examples based on uh, operation observations that have been in interest on Jupiter in the last year or two. 
Similar examples could no doubt be given for other planets as well, but I think this gives us a fair understanding of the range of potential observations that could be interesting. First of all, determining the nature of some features. Now, obviously, um, amateur telescopes have very good grasp of many of the features on Jupiter, but some very interesting features are really at the limit of, uh, of, of, of amateur imaging. And here I'm showing um, what's rather well known now, Clyde Spot in the South Temperate region as an example. Uh, there have been a number of talks on that over the years, uh, over the last couple of years on Zoom, so I won't go through the details. But suffice to say that this was a vigorous convective outbreak that appeared unexpectedly in a small pale cyclone within the South Temperate Belt. And it's gone on to become uh, an expanding new turbulent segment of the South Temperate Belt. So this shows a series of images before, and during, and after the main outbreak. And it shows them as taken with an amateur telescope on the top, uh, with Hubble in the middle, and Juno Cam on the bottom. So with Juno Cam, we've been very fortunate to get images of Clyde Spot or, or one, of the, one of the precursor cyclones of the type that gave rise to it at various intervals during this process. And you can see this little cyclone here, which is similar to the one where Clyde Spot appeared, is beautifully shown with cyclonic structure with Juno Cam. Then this was the outbreak itself, an expanding bright cloud over the pre-existing cyclone. And here you see how it has grown into a large complex uh, structure we call a folded filamentary region, and that's continued to grow. So we were very fortunate that Juno Cam could show exactly what was happening at each of these stages. In amateur images, the precursor spot was only imaged as this very faint thing, which we suspected was a, a small cyclone, but couldn't prove that from amateur images. Um, and if you look in the later stage, you can see the sort of spotty structure here. We suspect things like this are folded filamentary regions, but it really takes a larger telescope to prove it. But if you look at the Hubble images, you can just make out this cyclonic structure in these two um, similar uh, 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 little cyclones, and you can make out the, the, the patchy structure in the FFR that it's developed into. So if there were observations with, say, the peak Dimidi of quality that you saw at the beginning, then it would be possible to determine the nature of features like this uh, without having to have the good luck of JunoCam observations. Secondly, obtaining the zonal wind profiles. Now, uh, here the uh, peak to media image that I showed you earlier is paired with an image taken by Chris Go 10 hours earlier. And you can see the main structure of Jupiter's winds, that is winds blowing to the east or to the west in different latitudes, which can be beautifully determined if you have high resolution observations over intervals of 10 hours or 20 hours, that's the rotation period or double it. Um, now it is possible to get zonal wind profiles from amateur images alone. Uh, this is an example done by uh, Marco Vedovato in 2019, uh, using uh, images, with, I think, with C14s on the whole. Um, so this is a plot of wind speed against latitude, which is a very good approximation to what can be obtained with Hubble or other spacecraft. But it could be done better if one had observations with a telescope like the PT Medi or perhaps some of the other Europlanet telescopes. Now, obviously, if one is only limited to telescopes in Europe, then one couldn't do the entire zonal wind profile. One would need a telescope on another continent in order to get observations 10 or 20 hours apart. But uh, even if there isn't another professional telescope that could provide that, uh, it might be possible to plan observations with a telescope in Europe uh, that had fairly reliable uh, you know, observing conditions and with an amateur, say, in the Far East or Australia or in America who also had fair expectation of good observing conditions. That would definitely improve the prospect of getting a zonal wind profile, which could well be important if there is a particular upheaval in a particular latitude of Jupiter, uh, and we would want to know whether the speeds of the jet streams or the arrangements of the jet streams, for instance, have changed. Thirdly, um, support for Juno. And the uh, the, the, well, one of the ways in which um, amateur images are already supporting Juno very much is in looking at the, around the longitudes of Perijove, uh, where amateurs can pick up features that are moving to and fro at low latitudes, 
and determine exactly what the narrow angle JunoCam images are, 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 are seeing. And it's not just JunoCam itself, but also the microwave radiometer from Juno uh, is, is passing over very, a very narrow strip every time Juno comes, comes to Perijov. And you need the ground-based images to say what exactly the microwave radiometer is looking at at that time. This is an example from the last but one Perijov, PJ38, uh, the North Equatorial Belts. The, the NEB is now extremely narrowed. Most of its width has, has faded to almost white. There's just this North Equatorial Belt South component, which is still dark. And along the south edge, where normally there are great big dark features, uh, almost all of those have now disappeared. And instead, there are much smaller features which are moving uh, extremely fast, much faster than the usual current. So this is a very unusual state. And one additional uh, wrinkle on it at the moment is that there are numerous small outbreaks occurring within the NEB South component. Otherwise, the belt's completely um, faint and, and quiet. But these little outbreaks have started sporadically during 2021 and have become very uh, frequent in the last month or two. So JunoCam was very lucky to get a close-up image of one of these at PJ38, which was uh, back in, at the end of November, and also at PJ39, which was earlier, which was in January. Um, but in order to understand what it was looking at, you really needed the amateur observation. So this is a series from late November. An outbreak had started here. Uh, there was an earlier one, which already expanded. Um, and you can see how this little very bright white spot, which is a convective plume erupting within the, that belt, uh, has, has um, begun to move after several days, has spread into the uh, equatorial zone here just a couple of days before Perijo 38, which was on November, November 29th and occurred uh, at the Blue Cross. That's where it crossed the, crossed the equator. So it's only from these amateur images that one could tell that what Juno flew over and imaged in these beautiful images here um, was the outbreak spot that had spread into the edge of the equatorial zone and was beginning to form a little blue festoon around it. And we have a very similar story now from uh, Perigeo 39, which actually I was just working on last night, and we see even more of this uh, beautiful outbreak at that occasion. Um, then finally, uh, another aspect of supporting the Juno mission is to characterize the flow patterns in the polar regions. Now we've done that in the South Polar region over the last four years. These are JunoCam maps taken a, a maybe an hour or so apart at one perijove, um, centered on the, South Pole, on the South Pole, which is here. And you can see that JunoCam reveals fantastic wind motions in the polar regions, this wavy jet stream around here, these FFRs here, um, which could never be seen from, from, from the Earth. And that's a, that's a diagram in, indicating the, the sort of features that Juno Cam was, was looking at. But uh, Juno is not able to track most of these features between perigodes, that they were 53 days apart at the time. Uh, very few of these features could be matched up from one perigode to another. So it was necessary to use some of the best amateur images of the planet, uh, which can in fact detect features up in the latitudes of interest. You know, it's indicated by, by the blue and arrow, blue and white arrows uh, on, on these maps here. So we were able to characterize the motions in this South Polar region for the first time, and that's just been published um, a month or two ago in, in Icarus. Now, uh, Juno is getting a better view of the North Polar region. The sun has now set on the South Pole, but has risen on the North Pole. Juno Cam is getting lower over the North Pole, uh, but also getting uh, rather longer coverage as it flies over the North. So hopefully in the coming years, it may be possible to repeat with, in, with, with the North Polar region um, what we've managed to do with the South Polar region. And this is where the Europlanet Telescope Network could be extremely valuable because it'd be possible to arrange observations, uh, high resolution imaging observations around the times of Juno's perigoves for several days, uh, perhaps weeks ar around a perigove um, with the in intention 
of getting observations that are sufficiently good that one could map some of these re some of these features up in up in the North Polar region and track them outside the few hours of, of Juno's own observations. So there's a few examples of how I think uh, the Euroatlantic Telescope Network could have been useful in promoting the science of some of the phenomena that we're observing on Jupiter just at the moment. No doubt very pleasant, plenty of others in the future. So that's all I had to say. So I'll be happy to answer any questions if there are any. Thank you, John. And thank you for uh, being so, so good with the time. We have time for some questions, actually. So any questions for, for John? I see Gunter has his hand up. Gunter? Yes, uh, concerning your rapid response. Uh, hi, uh, by the way, I'm Gunter Kagel. I'm running for Europe Planet the Telescope Network currently. Mm. So all the funding goes essentially through me. And uh, so far, when you have when we have applications, so roughly the committee meets every two months to make some recommendations. And then we decide, so that's uh, Grazina, Sarunas and me, we finally decide on the funding. But we became aware that sometimes uh, two months is a bit too long. So uh, if you have some urgent observations, which uh, based on an alert or something, which has to be immediately observed, I think we can shorten down the response time before we grant you the, the funding to a couple of days in a pinch. I guess we can do it in a day if it's really urgent. Mm. Oh, that's, that's so if it's helpful. something that's really urgent, you need to flag that. Mm. Uh, best send in your application together with some email maybe from the observatory where you want or need to do that and then we can really promise to process it really rapidly right that that would be very helpful so, so i suppose an observer could make an arrangement with an observatory that they would be able to take observations very quickly given the target of opportunity and then apply to you immediately if something was seen Yes, normally I mean, we get well in, the, in advance notice for observations. So we usually have given the frequency of uh, applications every two months a session. But of course, uh, this might be too short. And uh, uh, at least we, we have to have some formalities because there's EU money. So they insist of certain, let's say, procedures. But if it's really urgent, I can really say we, we should be able to do it with a couple of days and in urgent cases. But this should be really indicated at some point otherwise we won't know about it uh, we could do it in a day if really necessary but uh, a couple of days should be possible if it's a really uh, observation of opportunity but of course then you need to provide us all the information that means who is going to do the observation why why is it so fast necessary, necessary to do it so fast because we need to have some some ways to judge it i think that's everything for my side yeah, I think that in such a case, you should need to, to be working in parallel, contacting the observatory and the European Telescope Network at the same time to get very fast observations. And some examples could be the onset of a new uh, uh, large disturbance in one of Jupiter's um, regions. In, For instance, another event of the North Temperate Belt. You want to observe that very fast, uh, soon in the first days. And of course, if there is an, another impact with the debris in the planet, then you want to observe the next day or... <laughs> Yes. As soon as possible, as fast as possible, uh, before the, the debris disappears. So it's different in, in, in its mm. case. Mm. But we can try to react rapidly in case the, there is a, um, a scientific reasons behind that. And those cases are, uh, of course, well motivated. So it might make sense for observers who want to take part in this to um, schedule some, you know, some, some regular observations with uh, a given observatory, set up the collaboration, um, make sure that they know how to do things, um, and then uh, um, uh, apply for the option of having a target opportunity uh, if it arises. Yeah, it's it's better if you have experience at the telescope for these things that are these these events that are very very rapid, and then there are some telescopes in which you are not doing the observations, but the people at the observatory does the observation for you. And those are um, service mode observations that you can apply in many different observatories, uh, in many different telescopes in the network. But each telescope operates in a different manner. For instance, the Pic du Midi, uh, uh, Francois uh, needs to be there to, to do the observation or someone with a good experience. 
I think there was another question by Richard Smooth. Richard, yeah. Uh, John, um, the North, uh, the, the, the barges are kind of interesting. I think there's like eight of them I've been tracking at least. And the, the drift rate seems to be a little bit faster than normal. Do you have anything to say about that or? Um, the drift rate was also seen to be abnormal in 2011, 2012, when the same phenomenon happened in the NEB. I don't remember exactly which direction it moved in offhand, I, I ought to check. Um, but yes, um, that's an interesting example of why it would be good to have a, um, a zonal wind profile, actually. Yeah. Um, the NEB is so odd at the moment um, that one would wonder whether the zonal wind profile has been changed. Um, Hubble, of course, um, I should have mentioned it's in this connection, um, does observations once a year. You, uh, oh. It's possible with a pair of, of complete maps taken 10 to 20 hours apart. Um, and the zonal wind profiles are, are extracted from that by, by the people who run that OPAL program. Um, but um, of course, we might well be interested in doing something outside those times when, when Hubble is observing. Um, likewise with Juno um, perigoves, Hubble has often been able to schedule observations um, on the day of a Juno perigove, but not always. And I think that opportunity is less than it was. Um, so again, there's good reason for getting ground-based telescopes to do that. Thank you, John. Any other question for John or? If not,